Warning. Let's begin this Storm Spirit breakdown by taking a quick look at the picks. While usually I'll take Storm into any matchup, and thus face some harder mids, this match already began favorably thanks to the 9th Tinker pick, making my usual Storm pick a natural counter. Of course, if the rest of my team doesn't do that well, a good Tinker with an early hex can completely take over the match, so storming to Tinker is not a guaranteed win. Let's take a look at the rest of the picks to try to decide how the match should be playing out. For position 1, we've got Slark vs Razor. This already poses a challenge as Razor can begin fighting way earlier than Slark, so unless our Slark completely dominates his lane, we're looking at a rough early game for us. Despite that, Slark scales better than Razor into the late game, and our Nyx remains a natural Tinker counter throughout the entire match too. So, regardless of the early game outcome, if we can hold out too late without losing Raxis, there's a strong chance the match is ours. So, based on picks alone, what can I deduce about how the match will go is our side lanes will probably lose, mid will draw even, and I will have to participate in fights earlier than I would like to, just to hold the game together while Slark and possibly Slardar plays catch up. Now, let's jump into laning. The starting items are quite standard. Two nulls will extend my mana pool and bring right click damage on par with Tinkers, and the branch is there to hold my HP high until the battle arrives. No self, as Tinkers damage is very predictable and I expect to have my battle ship before minute 2. So, even if Tinker does get me low, the battle will fix that right away. Battle Rush is the default choice, as nothing about Tinker would prevent you from venturing out to collect runes. If the hero was well versed in rune control, a case could be made for going nulls and region instead, but not in this matchup. Now, what we will want to do is create a situation where Tinker might want to use Q to prevent Storm from last hitting, and then pull the creeps away to stop them from taking damage, thus buying time to hit them while Laser Blind is expiring. This also makes sure that you can easily secure the range creep while Blind is on cooldown. What a bounty! Denied! Glorious! And once battle is secure, it is no longer necessary to drop remnants to secure every single creep. Mana is still a viable resource, as you can use the remnant in situations where a double last hit is possible or securing range creep as needed. So, in this case, since I have battle shipped, I can serve my mana and use simple right click instead, just in case I would be unsuccessful in picking up the rune. Not for the likes of you. And right after, the opportunity presents itself as I have aligned the creeps in a way that even if I'm blinded, they will die from a remnant anyway, rendering Tinker's only tool in lane useless. Now, by double waving under his tower, I end up trapping Tinker with his food source right on his high ground. This allows me to stack the camp, take the rune, and return to the lane without missing any last hits. Now, one tiny laning mistake I did is I did not ship out a self to myself sooner. After battle versus Tinker, self should be the next highest priority. Not only will Blind deal more damage, some Tinkers might opt for leveling rockets too, significantly increasing their harassment potential. Selves help is still relevant in such lanes. Quick tip here, illusions can not only be used to boost last hit potential, but are handy to stack the camps. Dyer's courier. By now Tinker is keeping the waves neatly pinned on his own high ground. This is both good and bad play. If I approach the wave from low ground, I'm bound to eat the laser plus right clicks and spend a good amount of time dragging back the creeps to a more favorable position. So essentially, the waves becomes his real estate and he controls that monopoly. Now thing is, that's a very smart play versus mids that cannot flash farm or do not utilize the runes well. Against the storm however, it is not such a great play. Him maintaining the waves on his high ground, while preventing me from approaching creep safely unless I live on selves, completely opens up runes for my collection, and I also have pre-stacked some camps during my earlier rotations. So in reality, 
Tinker, a hero that on his own can flash farm jungle very well, resorts to just maintaining lane control, while Storm is free to pick up runes and clear his jungle camps. More so, him leveling Q is now useless because I don't feel the need to show in the lane at all. Now let's acknowledge a slight misplay here. Disruptor is a sure kill and I will be very close to level 6. What happens next is a gamble. I can see Tinker no longer showing in the lane, which means he is most likely going to check on me in this area. I could play it safe and travel back to the base on foot, or I could try to nuke down the camp next to me, which will surely give me level 6 and allow to safely zip down from a potential Tinker. Walking to base is slightly detrimental, with me having full mana, so I take the gamble and go for the camp, knowing full well I might die in the process. This gamble didn't pay off, but the takeaway is know your potential scenarios and risk versus reward. Some gambles will pay off and are often game deciding. By now I'm level 6 and Tinker abandoned the lane holding strategy. Since he won't hover near the lane for long, I don't even consider weakening him for the kill and just focus on my own farm instead. So my rotation remains unchanged, lane, rune, jungle. And of course, instead of nuking the camps one by one, try to stack the big ones first. At some point, Tinker again decided to maintain the high ground position and hold waves, which reduces his potential farm in the jungle. Same as before, I am open to collect runes and maintain my own farm through the jungle, so I don't even bother contesting the wave. If the situation is right, however, I could just zip in, clean up the range creep and whatever else I can before the blind and zip out, but this is mana intensive. With me being free to take runes, I begin thinking about where would I want to be to help the side lanes. In most cases, the position 1 would benefit the most from extra space, so with a convenient pickup of Arcane Rune, I head there. If the side lanes would have won on their own, I would probably spend more time on my own lane jungle rotations and just show up for objectives or dives. But because at this point we're losing the network game, I'm sacrificing a bit of my own pacing to bring others up to speed. Quick note here, I aim to place the mango tree in a fairly open area to have easier time collecting the trapped mangoes and at the same time making sure that the early game rotation there is unlikely. Of course, it could be placed further down the base, but by then the travel time to get there is just not worth it. One play as a storm we can always consider is suddenly appearing to cap the enemy's outpost. By zipping past any potential vision, I give the enemies no time to react and the minute 10 experience is solely our teams. Be careful though, later they can expect it and use uncapped outposts as a bait, killing you while you're most vulnerable. But here, it went very smooth and even resulted in a kill on my way back without needing to take a detour. These kind of rotations are always best as you're taking kills in between objectives and are not slowing down your farm for those kills. This next death is my own fault. Nyx missed a stun, I went in anyway, no one else to blame. My death gave the enemies confidence and just like that the early game is over and mid game begins. With fights being more prominent now, I must choose my initiations carefully. Until level 12 with Kaya, my mana capabilities are still very limited and I could get caught in either Disruptors or Mars' ult. For now, I let my teammates initiate and only engage after the big spells are used. <laughs> 
Just like the last fight resulted in the enemy being more aggressive, this fight made them plan their next move carefully, in return giving us breathing room. With nothing much happening at the moment, I prioritize finishing my bloodstone before anything else. But just in case fight breaks out, I'm level 12, have Kaya, and can reach wherever needed fast enough. Of course, protecting our own towers is a priority too. Notice how we don't farm too far from the objectives they might want to take. Nyx is currently sitting around the middle, which leaves me free to take the more dangerous farm, which is the open area by our gone safe lane tower. By pushing here, I will either continue to free farm and eventually threaten their tower, or force a rotation which in turn will take the pressure off our mid tower. Losing a tower equals last space equals harder mid game, so the goal is to always play around those objectives, whether offensive or defensive. A little note to make when playing against disruptors, early level glimpse often has quite a short range, and the way disruptors initiate is they will apply Q to maintain vision, and should their team be nearby, glimpse to win for the kill. As soon as I get tagged with Q, I bail out without risking a death using all my mana to get as far away as possible. Unfortunately, I got flanked, so in the end it didn't work out anyway. Always be on the lookout for solo overextending enemies. These can pop up in any MMR games. In the meanwhile, quick notice about the talents. Because I am looking to spend most of my early game in the jungle, the region at 10 greatly helps with sustain. If, however, we'd have won all the lanes, overload damage would help deathballing, which is not the case for this match. A note here, Storm with a convenient rune can often take some calculated risky dives and come out on top. Here I have regen and I managed to juggle just enough in and out to secure the kill and the terra push, all while being untouchable. In this match in particular, my own and Nyx's main target would always be Tinker. The more slippery the hero is, the more troublesome will he be during the fights. Since we're the ones with the tools to take Tinker out, we'll make him our priority to engage on. The note from previously still stands though. If you're vulnerable, make sure to wait out the bigger ults. And by now, we have earned a decent timing on the bloodstone. Forget about the lane jungle rotations, that is all done. Now our priority is full-time fight engagements. Either through the smoke gangs, enemy side farming, or just pushing back their efforts, I will always be ready to join the fight. And even if the enemy isn't willing to initiate, the extra region helps me be extra aggressive in my own farm, which again is beneficial for us. As the longer the game goes on, the more tools we get to deal with the tanker. And with tanker down, the rest of their team easily crumbles. If you've exhausted most of your resources, feel free to use the scroll to TP back to the base, it is likely you'll have it ready again for the next movement.
And by now we have earned ourselves a BKB. And this is the final power spike for me in this match to become unstoppable. Now I can initiate anywhere, anytime without too much worry. And none of the spells are of any danger at the moment and all I need is my team to follow through on initiations. And of course, if BKB is expiring or expires, be extra careful because by this point enemy probably has some tools to lock you down to death. Where's the body? If you think the heart of nature's power... Tinker is making the right play by purchasing Ghost Captor. If Storm is the one who needs to initiate on Tinker, it becomes tricky to perform a clean kill. Even if you manage to land a short range zip to deal the minimum damage required to disable Blink, you can't follow up in an attack and Tinker finishing a rearm is now away again. It's a cat and mouse precision game. But if we do catch Tinker, they lose a significant portion of their deep pushing capabilities and that's when our team needs to go full overdrive mode and claim as much map space as possible. And naturally, as Neex is best suited for this catching job, he goes on solo adventures around the woods a lot, also often getting clipped by the enemy team that is expecting such activities. But just in case the entire enemy team isn't hiding in the same spot, I am ready to jump right in and get a few pickoffs. And eventually, we make a good habit to catch Tinker over and over. Thank <laughs> you. 
One bad habit of mine is to first collect important items, then begin saving for a buyback. In this match, by minute 30, I don't have one ready, and the base is being currently pushed in, which, under different circumstances, could cause bigger damage or a loss. For the remainder of the match, the flow is pretty much set. We gank, grab a pick off, then push, slowly claiming more and more space and control of the map. Eventually, I grab a Hex, which is a really powerful tool to beef off my initiations, and, on someone like Tinker, can be devastating in preventing escape. In most of my matches, I prefer Hex over Orchid, as the former also hard disables items, considering most heroes carry a Glimmer, Mules, Manta or similar by the mid to late game. Also, a neat thing to consider is that when you're ahead and for one reason or another throw a team fight, the enemy cannot push because the team fight happened near their base. If the stronger team can dictate the terms of engagement and choose to selectively seek out fights far away from your own ancient, the result is often that by the time the enemy has used one team fight to push in the creeps, most of the defending heroes have respawned. Eventually, Tinker uses the buyback, so upon his next death, we plan to end the match. At this point of the game, the match is pretty much secured, so let's take this time to answer the remainder of the viewers' questions. There was a brief period fresh at the 7.24 when I was considering trials to be the superior footwear, thanks to the fact that the outposts were much more sought after resource, with XP being awarded each 5 minutes and all the fights congregating around them. 
Nowadays, we're defaulting back to threads, as the attack speed is a great steroid to the early mid game farming rotations. Travels is a good consideration much later in the match though, especially from a defense standpoint, as it allows Torp to quickly take care of multiple incoming creep waves and offset any pushes. Alternatively, it also works if you find yourself teamfighting a lot and need to be full mana often, as using the TP scroll and then boots back lets you to quickly refresh your fighting capabilities. The first two talent choices were covered earlier, let's cover the other two. Attack speed is the default if you're aiming to be the damage dealing position too. Alternatively, with a control build such as Aghanim's plus one, the other talent becomes better. Level 25 talent is still a no-brainer. To me, the worst matchups are the ones where you will need to spend extra resources to stay relevant not only until level 6, but afterwards as well. Huskar might be hell to lane against, but first few levels are manageable, and the rest can be spent in the jungle. Come mid-game, Huskar poses very little threat to Storm by himself. On the other hand, someone like Lina and Sky, with just levels, can catch Storm off guard and delete him on the spot. If you see you're losing your lane, the most important thing is to not die. Stack some camps for yourself and only return to the lane if the creeps are under the tower. Remember, if the opponent only stays in lane, he's getting limited farm than what he would otherwise get by shoving and jungling. If you're talking ultra late game, one Bloodthorn plus Hex cast should be enough to either kill the Pudge or force him to fall back. Either way, as with all the late game tanky heroes, simply focus him last. Outside of hooks and the ultimate, he's not that dangerous. Storm is best picked into teams with soft lockdowns or hard lockdowns counterable by BKB. Storm wants to spend the early game farming more than fighting, so pair him with an active position 1, such as Ursa or Lifestealer. Overall, two builds are most used. First one being Rushing Orchid, for when the team is strong enough to take over the match, so you're doubling down on the kill potential. If things go wrong, however, you're quite vulnerable yourself. Outside of low MMR matches, I do not recommend going Orchid first unless you can read the match. The other build is Kaya Bloodstone, which is what I build most of the time and would recommend to other aspiring storms. There is also a utility storm with something such as Aghanims plus Shivas or Lotus, but if lockdown and control is what you're after, there are better heroes for that. If you're in dire need of defenses fast, your go-to route would be Eul Sinchi BKB. You will be able to participate in any fight with great success, but your mana region will be next to non-existent, so if fights are happening often, this could be detrimental. Whether you want to fight or farm is largely dependent on the matchup and it's too broad a topic to summarize in a sentence. By default, farm until your first big item and only help the team if they are losing on their own or a good rune opportunity presents itself. I find myself carrying the two nulls way into the late game, so yeah, they are of great value. Yes, Storm has a weaker early to mid game, but really spikes up by the end. In contrast, Ember and Void start out stronger, but their late game potential doesn't deviate much from mid game potential. With Storm, Unless there is a good runer or tower dive, we only want to begin looking for fights after level 12 and at least Kaya. Keeping mangoes for emergency and clarities for roaming is all you'll ever need in regards to mana management. And of course, swap threads and pocket items as needed. Shoving out the creep wave and then farming closest camp or closest stacked camp is the best practice. As long as you return in time for the next wave, you're good. Later in the game, same applies to all the waves on the map. Pick one lane you can safely farm and clear camps next to it in between lane creeps. That is all for both the questions and the topic. Thank you for watching, good luck.